oh, awesome. Did I hit the button? Did you hit the button? It seemed like a really smooth transition. All right, which I mean, it's me. That almost never happens. All right, so welcome everyone. We're going to be kicking, uh, kicking off where we left off and we're writing the forward to the second edition. And so we're picking up on page XVII. So XVII forward to the second edition. And if you're trying to find it, because listen, Roman numerals is not many of our cup of tea. Uh, although some of us are like really into Roman numerals and I'm here for that. I love that. Absolutely. Any sort of nerdy interest I'm here for. But if you go to the very first page that is the forward to the second edition, page XV, and you flip the page, flip it, we're going to be on the right hand side of the page, XVII. Hopefully we're all there because I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving the page, I'm giving the route to get there. And where we're kicking off is uh, right near the bottom. It's the bottom full paragraph and it's right after uh, the sentence that says uh, that the number of members having substantial sobriety time behind them was sufficient to convince the membership that a new light had entered the dark world of the alcoholic. Now, I'm gonna, I made this joke last week. I'm going to make this joke this week. Great name for a big book study. It's so fitting. You know, it fits so well. Somebody should call their Monday night big book study. That is just good. But also, thank you. Thank you. I do constantly need approval. We don't need to look at that too hard. I'm kidding. I do. I inventory that quite a bit. Um, but what, but what, what, were, what are we talking about there? We're talking about substantial sobriety. Substantial sobriety by the late 1937. Bill got sober right at the start of 1935. So substantial sobriety was like two years, a year and a half. You know, that was substantial sobriety. And I, I want to point this out because when we talk about the forward to the second edition, we talk about the wholesale miracle that has taken place. You know what I mean? I, I talk about like, I believe in miracles because I'm a miracle. I believe in miracles because I sit in a Zoom room and see 32 at present miracles before me. People that should not be sober, people that should not be clean, people that should not have freedom from the addiction that brings them to the study, and yet here we are. A light is on in their eyes. There is a hope that fills their spirit. Man, that's, that's what's happening. But two years at most, at very most, about a year and a half at like second most, you know, that tells us that substantial sobriety was not something that happened readily and easily before Alcoholics Anonymous came along. And it's, it's a reminder of, of the, the preciousness of our own sobriety. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and really the wholesale miracle that has taken place. So it goes on to say, it was now time the struggling group sought to place their message and unique experience before the world. Because, hey, there's something that's working. These silly little drunks are staying sober. People are staying sober. Like something's happened. We've got to share this unique experience before the world. And what I want to point out is if you guys uh, remember in kindergarten uh, or elementary school, it's called the telephone game. It has different names in parts of the world, but essentially the telephone game where you, you play that game where it's like, um, <laughs> let's hope Toronto wins the Stanley Cup you know and we put that we put that to go around the room that's for Rob and then it comes it comes back around and it's like go San Jose Sharks and it's like <laughs> see what I did yeah we got some hockey fans so I'm working with them I'm working with them uh but it goes around the room and the meeting has completely changed and what they wanted to do is to avoid that that changing of the meaning, the changing of the message. So to put this unique experience before the world, it says this determination, this idea, this goal bore fruit. To bear fruit is to get some results, you know? Like if you plant a lemon tree, the results are hopefully some lemons. Listen, if you get a grapefruit out of it, you might have you might have done horticulture wrong, you know what I'm saying? But it bore fruit. Um in the spring of 1939 by the publication of this volume. So they published this book. This book that we're reading goes out to the world. And again, what is the purpose of this book? The main purpose of this book is to precisely carry this message, the message of how we can recover from this illness. 
so that that message doesn't get lost. So it doesn't turn from go Leafs to go Sharks, you know, or to go Sharks to go Leafs, you know. I'm not saying one message is better than the other, but what I'm saying is so that message doesn't get lost. And it says, the membership had then reached about 100 men and women. It was 80. It was 80 dudes. And like at the time, it was one woman. And at the time it was published, it was this gal by the name of Florence Rankin. And uh, we can be super grateful for her. Uh, she was not, she didn't have permanent sobriety, but she's a big reason why this book is not called 100 Men. Because <laughs> they're like, oh, that's such a great name. In fact, it's such a great name to try to, to get scraped together money to write this book. We should create a corporation called the 100 Men Corporation and sell shares in it. And she was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, guys, absolutely not. This is not verbatim. As uh, Florence Rankin is her name. So Florence, F-L-O-R-A-N-C-E or E-N-C, I'm not sure. And then Rankin, R-A-N-K-I-N, uh, Florence Rankin. Now, she she didn't have permanent sobriety, but she was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, guys, we ain't calling it 100 men. We'll have to get a different name. And we're going to talk about that different name here in a moment. Um, so the fledgling society and fledgling, sorry to those that were early and were hearing my fun facts about birds. Uh, I apologize profusely, uh, but a fledgling is like a very, very new bird, like a bird that is just about trying to see if they can fly out of the nest. That's what it means to be a fledgling. So this society, which was beginning to fly out of the nest, to take flight, um, had which had been nameless, because we we were hanging out in the Oxford group for a couple of years. We were the drunk squad of the Oxford group, and we and we wonder why they like were not jazzed to always have us. You know, it's like these upper class, you know, uh, society people that want a deeper experience of God, and drunks that are shaking and vomiting. You know, we're ruining their doilies. You know. Uh, they they actually were happy to have us. Uh, so uh, so the fledgling society had been nameless, now began to be called Alcoholics Anonymous from the title of its own book. And I really want to emphasize this. Alcoholics Anonymous is the title of the book. And the fellowship, Alcoholics Anonymous, is named after the book, not the other way around. You might think, I mean, I thought it was the other way. It's like, oh, we had a name, we had a thing, and then we like wrote a book. No, we are named after the book, which again emphasizes the importance of this book to the fellowship, Alcoholics Anonymous. And just a little bit like Rob's putting some fun facts in the chat. So if, you, if you're new here and you're like, Paige, I, my ADHD is worse than yours. Wonderful. Uh, Rob's got you. <laughs> you just you follow what's happening in the chat. It's a whole lot of fun. Um, it genuinely it's a lot of fun. Uh, but when when AA in those early days wasn't even called Alcoholics Anonymous, it was one drunk helping another. And we were seeing that alcoholics were getting well and staying well, like there was something here. Now, the guys in Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill, mostly Bill and Hank and Fitz, less so Dr. Bob, they were like, we got to carry this. Yay, Rob. Yes, always. Yay, Rob. Uh, <laughs> they were like, we got to we got to come up with some ideas. And some of their ideas was the first idea they had was to have a professional paid class of AA. Now, ironically, uh, Dr. Bob, who was like, I'm not really involved in some of your schemes to like get this thing off and running. He was the only person that received some money because he was the most successful 12 stepper and he was not doing well financially. Um, for some reason, a newly sober colorectal surgeon wasn't like reining in the clients, you know what I mean? Uh, and so he had, he was given a little bit of money, but thankfully other people knew better than us and we're like, ah, uh -uh, we're not giving you money. That'll ruin this thing. And we're like, oh man, hey, could we actually get, we have this other idea. Could we open up a hospital for alcoholics? where we like essentially like an AA treatment center where we treat alcoholics because hospitals don't like us. And they looked into that. They were looking into property in Akron, Ohio. Didn't get enough money for that. And I just want to point this out because we had these ideas, right? I'm sure no one here relates to those alcoholic grand plans and designs. 
Uh, but we had these ideas and thankfully people knew better than us and God knew better than us. And what I mean by that is, isn't it always when we don't get what we think we need, when we don't get what we want, are we given what we need? And so they were able to scrape together enough money to buy this book, you know, to create this book, to publish this book. And thank good, thank goodness. And they, and listen, if you think they immediately hit altruism and like, oh, those are terrible ideas, as we could imagine, you know, for paid 12 steppers or like a whole hospital, like that's just was not a good idea. No, no, no. They were hoping that they would, mostly Hank, was hoping that they could sell enough copies of this book. They're like, heck yeah, we're going to have a hospital and like, yeah, pay me, you know. Uh, Listen, I, I sometimes do Hank a little dirty, uh, but I, I, I got a soft spot for Hank because he was about as chaotic as I was, or I am, am, present tense on my chaos. Anywho, uh, but, but again, thankfully we didn't get what we wanted and instead we got what we needed, which was the publication of this book. So as this book goes out into the world, it goes on to say the flying blind period ended. Because we now have concise directions, yeah, 35 to 39, trying to figure it out the most effective way to work with others. We now have the directions put into print. So we're no longer flying blind. And if you're ever feeling like, man, Paige, I don't know if I could work with others. I don't know if I could sponsor others. We don't have to fly blind. Ooh, that works really well with the fledgling metaphor, the flying blind. Some of you are like, oh no, oh no, she's found more bird puns. No, no, yes. Yes, <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry, uh, but um, I'm nervous to sponsor. I don't got to fly blind. The directions on how to get well are right here. You know, we get to we get to carry this message. We don't have to figure it out. So uh, it says, with the appearance of the new book, a great deal began to happen. And so what we're transitioning into is as the book went, this book went out into the world, we're going to look at the rapid growth of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then we're going to have a look at like, ooh, some of the stuff like, ooh, we got some rapid growth. Ooh, there, there could be some difficulties with that and how we manage that. So it says, with the appearance of the new book, a great deal began to happen. Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick, I always have to say that name carefully. Uh, I'm an adult. Uh, the, no, the noted clergyman reviewed it with approval. So th there's this Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick. He was this well-known, well-respected guy. And he's saying, hey, this, this is a good book. Like there's something here. And so that got us positive publicity. Uh, in the fall of 1939, Fulton Owersler, then editor of Liberty, printed a piece in his magazine called Alcoholics and God. And so Fulton Owersler, listen, Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick and Fulton, uh, Fulton Owersler, all I will say is mm, those names, they just, listen, you can just imagine a, a trashy romance novel and then Fulton Owersler, you know, no, uh, not, not the... Not the smoothest names on that. Uh, no judge. Listen, I, I I know what my name is. We're good. It's a furniture carnival. We I I know. I got a weird one. Uh, but Liberty was a magazine that would go out into the world. And then I'm kind of worried. I need to explain what a magazine is to people. I'm like, oh no, have I reached that point? So a magazine is a collection of uh, words and pictures. Uh, but it's. <laughs> What what I mean is that idea was that like easy consumable media. So it was like a lot of people would read magazines because it's cheaper than a book, you know. And uh, and so he print he printed this piece called Alcoholics and God. And so this brought in a rush of eight hundred frantic inquiries into the little New York office, which meanwhile had been established. Now I want to point something out. Bill's going to exaggerate a little. An alcoholic embellishing. I never. Uh, so there's about 80, 80 sober drunks. And imagine in your home group, or imagine, you know, uh, that there's about 80 people. And then to get your home group, let's say with the, and some of you are like, 80? Girl, that, that's ambitious. But just imagine 800 inquiries, 800 people asking. So imagine you're at your home group and you got 10, 12 step calls you got to get back to. You know what I'm saying? That I just I just want to put it in picture that idea of like oh wow people were reaching out 
and it's this little New York office, which meanwhile had been established. And uh, they were, they had been working out of honor dealers before then, and that thing, that was a sinking ship. Poor Hank. Uh, but this little office that was, it's like Bill, and like, and a secretary that is like responding to all of these, you know? And it says, each inquiry was painstakingly answered. Pamphlets and books were sent out. Businessmen traveling out of existing groups were referred to these prospective newcomers. And so they, every single inquiry they would try to respond to to get back to. This new group started up. And it was found to the astonishment of everyone that AA's message could be transmitted in the mail as well as by word of mouth. Man, if in the 1930s, at the end of the 1930s, this message, and this is a powerful message, but this message could be transmitted in the mail? It's no wonder. It's no wonder Zoom works. You know, it's no wonder that we can, we can meet together and work. You know what I'm saying? And I think it does speak to the power of this, this message. And it says, by the end of 1939, it was estimated that 800 alcoholics were on their way to recovery. Imagine, in your home group, there's 80 of you, and some of you are already overwhelmed by that number. And it's like, imagine it's spring, and some of you are like, girl, don't you dare skip over pumpkins by season. <laughs> like, that's what we're getting into. Don't you bring me to spring. But, uh, but imagine it's the spring, and there's about 80 of us. And then at the end, it, we hit December, we hit New Year's. And that 80 goes to 800. Oh, wow. We're seeing some like dramatic growth. And you might feel a little overwhelmed. So in the spring of 1940, John D. Rockefeller Jr. gave a dinner for many of his friends to which he invited AA members to tell their stories. And John D. Rockefeller Jr., he was a well-known famous philanthropist. So he would give a lot of money to a lot of causes. And I think the drunks were a little like, could we have some, please? And he's like, absolutely not. But also just as a, as a point of uh, interest, and you might be like, not interested, fair enough. Uh, feel free to disassociate for the next 10 seconds. He was actually a major prohibi prohibitionist. So he was anti-alcohol being legal and spent a lot of money trying to, uh, like, uh, towards prohibition causes. And so he had an interest in alcohol. And... Uh, less so alcoholism, but but I just wanted to tie that in as an interesting piece of information. And those of you who disassociated, you can come back now. <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> so news of this got on the world wire, <clears throat> and uh, and inquiries poured in again, and many people went to the bookstores to get the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Again, that is the title of this book. This book is called Alcoholics Anonymous. By March 1941, membership had shot up to 2,000 members. So I think spring in 39, and then you got uh, spring, like, so it's, it's just two years to go from 80 to 2,000. You know what I mean? Like that's, yeah, some incredible growth. And then it says, uh, then Jack Alexander wrote a feature article in the Saturday Evening Post and placed such a compelling picture of AA before the general public that alcoholics in need of help really deluged us. To deluge is to like be overwhelmed by. Now, I, I was worried because I made sure I grabbed the Jack Alexander article and I'm like, did I put it back after I grabbed it? Uh, so this is the Jack Alexander article and he actually wrote two articles. And uh, it was so positive, it was turned into an AA pamphlet. And listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this as a bit of a cliffhanger. Uh, if you are like, oh, Paige, I have tried everything there is to get sober. I bet you haven't tried some of the things that some of the guys were trying in here. Because <laughs> there are some wild things that some of these guys were trying before they came to AA. Just So that's just my little hook to get you to read that pamphlet. Oh. Oh, it is wild. Tell me about your milk leg if you read it. All right. <laughs> That's only funny to people who have read the Jack Alexander article. I want you to know I referenced this thing for years and didn't read it. I would get around to it when I was going to get around to it. I was asked to do a talk on a piece of a pamphlet I hadn't read and I picked this one so I would read it. See what I did there? Clever. Uh, but Jack Alexander, like why, why this article? Why would we turn this into a pamphlet? Who cares about this guy? 
Well, Jack Alexander was an investigative reporter. Think like 60 Minutes or Dateline NBC or 20, 2020, is that what it is? Uh, and, and I'm like, I don't know if any of those shows are still on the air. Like, I don't know if those still exist. But that idea of like, in an, his deal was like, I'm going to bust this scam. And he shows up to meet with these alcoholics and he is incredibly skeptical. He's like, what is this, like a Broadway performance? Like, what, what is this, you know? But the more he investigated, the more that he found that this thing was the real deal. So here is a guy who made his career on busting scams. And he's saying that Alcoholics Anonymous, that this is the real deal. This is alcoholics helping other alcoholics for free. And that there was something here that was worth. And so a guy that who is famously skeptical is saying, yeah, like, yeah, this is the real deal. That was a tremendous endorsement to Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the things that I want to point out is, how did AA begin to get its publicity? It wasn't AA like, you know, like with a, I always think of Bart Simpson uh, in the in the Simpsons when he's got like that pot and pan. And he's like, I am so great. Everybody loves me. I am so great like that. We weren't doing that. We weren't tooting our own horn. No horns were tooted in the Maida King of this fellowship. I don't know if that's true. Uh, Raul would be like, I'm actually Paige. Many a horn were, were tooted. There was a French and a trombone. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, the idea is other people were our able and persistent advocates. Other people saw the work that we were doing. Non-alcoholics were like, hey, there's something here. We didn't self-publicize. Uh, we let ourselves speak for ourselves. So um, so uh, we were overwhelmed, deluged us. By the close of 1941, AA numbered 8,000 members. Like to go two and a half years from 80 to 8,000. Oh, could you imagine? Oh, that is some growth. Yes. And it says the mushrooming process was in full swing. And we can think of that mushroom like a mushroom cloud and how it grows and it envelops. But lately I, I had this uh, uh, fungi related revelation. <laughs> so some of you guys are like, I'm so over this page. And you still haven't learned what type of plant it is. I think it's just a fungi. Uh, but uh, that idea that where does a mushroom grow? It grows in the dark. Where does Alcoholics Anonymous, where do 12 step fellowships go? We reach those who are in the dark. And from there we can grow, you know? So that's my that's my uh, horticultural moment. Uh, I'll probably have more because I'm weird. Uh, but it was in full swing. AA had become a national institution. It was something that was working and just a part of this thing. Our society then entered a fearsome and exciting adolescent period. Listen, if any of you guys have kids uh and it, you're approaching or have approached or whew, survived the fearsome and exciting adolescent period or if you're just like me and survived my own fearsome and exciting adolescent period oh adolescence those are those teenage years and those are rocky and so aa had its rocky teenage years as well and it says the test that it faced was this could these large numbers like eight thousand? Uh, numbers of erstwhile, erstwhile is sincere, you know, like very sincere and erratic. So erstwhile, erratic, fair, a little erratic, you know, a little all over the place. So we're sincere, but we're not the calm ocean we want to be, you know what I'm saying? Waters are a little choppy. Could these large numbers of erat erstwhile, erratic alcoholics successfully meet and work together? Would there be quarrels? Those are fights over membership. You can join, but you can't. Leadership, I'm the boss, and money. Ooh, and isn't that some we, like, just to take a pause, isn't that the things that I have quarrels with with myself? Who's on the in? Who's on the out? Who do I accept? Who do I reject? Membership, leadership. Do I not create a hierarchy in my mind of people? And, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure no one here has any financial difficulties. I'm sure you guys have no no relation to that fear of financial insecurity. No one, no one. But you know, and it said, would there be striving for power and prestige? Do I not know what that's like in my own life? 
you know, strivings for power, prestige, that, that praise, that validation, that gives me a sense of worth, you know? Would there be schisms which would split AA apart? So, uh, you know, this type of AA, that type of AA, like, would it be a divided fellowship? And I want to point something out. It says, soon AA was beset by these very problems on every side and in every group. The traditions were hammered out on the anvil of experience. The traditions developed from us doing it wrong. The traditions developed out of necessity. It, I like to joke that it wasn't like, you know, Bill and Bob were hanging around and like, oh, an angel came down and was like, oh, this is what you guys should do. You know, it was like, we weren't doing that and it wasn't going well. So we had to do something different. That's the origin of the 12 traditions. So it says, but out of this frightening and at first disrupting, disrupting experience, the conviction grew that AAs had to hang together or die separately. We had to unify our fellowship or pass off the scene. And when we talk about unifying the fellowship, we're talking about tradition one, that our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA or whatever fellowship you're a part of, unity. So if you're writing in your book, you can make a note tradition one, and if you're not writing in your book, you should, it's fun. Shenanigans over here, but do what you want. I won't tell you what to do. <laughs> and what we're gonna see, it says, as we discovered the principles by which the individual alcohol could live, so we had to involve, evolve principles by which the AA groups and AA as a whole could survive and function effectively. So the principles by which the individual alcohol, a alcoholic could live, those are the 12 steps. I survive my very survival, which is kind of a bummer because my very survival is based on this course of action that does not look appealing to me. You know what I mean? It's not good news. But my survival is contingent upon my daily action in the 12 steps. And the purpose of that is to produce a spiritual awakening. Now, when we talk about the, I'm just going to share something with you. When we talk about the principles of the steps, I take a bit of a different slant that, than many people take. So if I, what I'm saying is different than somehow you guys do it, what I want you to know, you are right. You are correct. I am wrong. But I always like to say, join me in being wrong. It's a lot of fun over here. You know, uh, I don't take the, the track that the principles are these nebulous concepts like hope and faith or courage or brotherly love or justice, although it can be really helpful to look at them through that lens. I don't want to diminish that. Instead, what I look at is that for me, the principles are of the 12 steps are the tangible actions of the 12 steps, which kind of helps me practice them in all my affairs. You know, I had a sponsee that texted me today and she's like, this is the longest line bank line that I've ever been in forever. And I was like, okay, what a beautiful, now I, she was not super happy to, to get this response. What a beautiful opportunity to turn to prayer and to meditation and to find a way to be of service and to look for the presence of God. She wasn't happy about that. <laughs> but for me, I can't, I don't know about you. Maybe you guys are better at pulling tolerance out of whatever orifice you pull it from and throwing it at a situation. But I can't just pull up tolerance. I need to channel God. I need to seek God. I need, to, do you know what I mean? So that, that's the approach I take. And if you're like, that's wrong. What I want you to know is you're right. I'm wrong. All righty. So now the, the principles by which the AA groups and AA as a whole could survive and function effectively are the 12 traditions. And just as, as an individual, my life depends on following the 12 steps. Uh, a 12 step fellowship survival is contingent on following the 12 traditions. So it says it was thought that no alcoholic man or woman could be excluded from our society. And what we see is tradition three. And we, we see that we're pointing to that long form of tradition three, you know, that idea like no alcoholic man or woman can be excluded. We can't kick you out. You don't want to kick you out, you know? It goes on to say that our leaders might serve, but never govern. We're talking about tradition too. There is leadership in 12-step fellowship. There's not governance. Because uh, listen, if my experiences, like 
don't tell me what to do. I do what I want. Y'all don't know me. You know what I mean? Like I, I turned into like, no, but leadership and keep in mind, we'll, we'll talk about this as we uh, touch on some of the traditions or we've already spoken about it, but the, the idea is like, there's not a hierarchy in any 12 step fellowship. It's not like there's a boss, a CEO, CFO. What happens is when I take a position in a 12 step fellowship, I'm taking a position of service. And what that looks like is that I am serving a table. And the more, the, the higher up the ladder, it's really lower, but that I take is the more people that I serve, the more groups that I serve, you know? So serve, but never govern. That each group was to be autonomous. So to be autonomous is to have the freedom to self-govern, the freedom to, to make their own decisions. And what we're talking about here is the fourth tradition. And, uh, some of you are like, oh, Paige, have you done talks on the traditions? Yeah, they've asked me to a couple times, uh, but I, I do this thing. I call tradition for the Spider-Man tradition. Pew, pew. You know, like it's different than pew, pew. It's pew, pew. It's completely different. Uh, but I call it the Spider-Man tradition. Because if you guys remember in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility, right? It's that same thing. With great autonomy comes great responsibility. Yeah, uh, XIX. Rob put it in the chat, but it, I, no, you're okay. No, no, no. I wanted to let you know so that I, you know that I thought and gave you the answer. And then I also wanted to acknowledge that Rob's work was not in vain. I just wanted everyone to be heard, felt, seen, and acknowledged. Well, not felt. About that. Yeah, heart feeling. Anywho. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is, this is how we do this. Uh, Spider Man. Because I have the freedom to make the decisions that I want as, as each group is free to make the decisions to run their group however they want, but they have that responsibility to consider other groups or the fellowship as a whole. So Spider-Man, uh, that there was to be no professional class of therapy. And what we're talking about there is the eighth tradition, that the 12th step is never, ever to be paid for. Because man, there is some, there is some really like, I don't know about you, but like the, the genuine nature of this thing, you know, like you're helping me because it helps you. You know what I mean? There's no ulterior motive, but I'm always looking for an ulterior motive because I don't think I'm worth helping. That the 12 step is never to be paid for. That we're there to be no fees or dues. Our expenses were to be met by our own voluntary contributions. We're talking about the seventh tradition. Seventh tradition. There was to be the least possible organization, even in our service centers, tradition nine. And I will point out that we're not talking about, ah, we ought not be organized. What we're talking about is that hierarchical structure that we are not organized as there's a boss and then there are subordinates and then there are subordinates below that. That when I take a position of service, it truly is to serve. Our public relations were to be based upon attraction rather than promotion. So that is at the public level. Uh, it was decided that all members ought to be anonymous at the level of press, radio, TV, and films. And those two sentences encompass the 11th tradition. It goes on to say, and in no circumstances should we give endorsements, uh, make alliances, or enter into public controversies. And what we see is tradition six where we're not gonna uh, you know, give endorsements, make alliances. And then tradition 10, we're avoiding any public controversy. And so that is what we're seeing is the 12 tradition. I know some of you are like, I'm so excited. I love it though, I love it. Oh, it's, oh, it's great, man. When you see like how the traditions flow or how they work and like, listen, nobody comes to, very few, I won't say nobody, maybe Rob did. Uh, <laughs> But uh, maybe Rob, uh, but nobody other than maybe Rob came to the traditions. They're like, oh boy, this looks interesting. I'd love to know more. How do we come to the traditions? The same way the traditions were formulated. My home group's on fire and everyone sucks. What do we do? You know, like it's not working. So we come to the traditions kind of the same way we come to the steps, you know, like things are on fire. Um, and so, but when I begin to see how practical, how practical these 12 traditions are, and then when I can see, do you know these 12 traditions, because they're spiritual principles, I can apply them wherever there is groups. 
I can apply them to a relationship. We can apply them to work. Like these are very, very applicable. So it says this was the substance of AA's 12 traditions, which are stated in full on page 561 of this book. So there's the long form and the short form. So, uh, and if you're wondering, you're not, uh, but a fun fact, just so that you could, you know, have this fun fact. It is, I think it's fun, but that the short form of tradition two is longer than the long form. That means the long form is shorter than the short form of the second tradition. Delightful. You get a win at AA trivia if you, if you, if you keep that one in the little noodle. All righty. Though none of these principles, so again, they are principles, had the force of rules or laws. They became so widely accepted by 1950 that they were confirmed by our first international conference held at Cleveland. And so the first international conference was in Cleveland. There's going to be an international in Vancouver. So just in 2025, throwing that out there. Why? Because it was in my brain. Uh, but but I, I love that it was in Cleveland because this is what I don't. Howard will come on camera and let me know if I'm wrong. Hi, Howard. Hi, Kathy. Uh, no pressure. Uh, but uh, how I imagine the, the history of this is that like that like Akron was like, we need to have the first international conference and New York was like, no, we need to have the first inter we're no. And then so they had to settle on Cleveland, which never settle on Cleveland, you know, Cleveland, it's great. So that's that's my historically accurate shenanigans. Uh, <clears throat> so it says, Today, the remarkable unity of AA is one of the greatest assets that our society has. And as we talk about unity, we're talking again about that tradition one. It's always important for me to remember, what are we unified on? You know what I mean? We're not just unified, but we're unified upon our common purpose. You know, our primary purpose to carry this message. So that's what we're unified around. And I just point that out as a helpful little thing. So. It says, well, the internal difficulties of her adolescent period were being ironed out. Listen, I'm still trying to iron out some of the internal difficulties of my adolescent period. I'm just kidding. The steps have done wonders for that. They've been ironed. Uh, public acceptance of AA grew by leaps and bounds. And it says, for this, there were two principal reasons. So two reasons why public acceptance of AA was growing. These are, these are them. It says the large numbers of recovery. So the first reason why people were like publicly accepting AA be because people were getting well and staying well. <clears throat> and the second reason, and reunited homes. Homes that were broken, families that were destroyed were now coming back together. These made their impressions everywhere. So what? <laughs> you got more info on Florence, my gal, Florence. <laughs> Sorry, Rod put something in the chat. Uh, so when it says these made their impressions everywhere, just something I want to emphasize, and I really love emphasizing as I go through this book, is Alcoholics Anonymous, the book, the, the, the program of action, none of this is an intellectual exercise. It is not what I think, what I feel, and what I know. It is experiential. And what carries weight? What carries weight with my family? What carries weight with my loved ones? What carries weight with society at large? Not what I think, not what I feel, and not what I know but the results of my actions and the results of the actions, the results, tangible results, people are getting well and staying well. That's what carried the message. And so now if you're like, oh, Paige, I wasn't jazzed about the traditions. Well, don't you worry. We're going to do some math. Woo! Yeah. I love the forward to the second edition. So it says of alcoholics who, who came to AA and really, really, tried. And I want to emphasize really tried because really tried doesn't feel like it's something that's quantifiable. How do you put a number on really tried? Well, we're going to come back and see what they really tried at. We're going to see what, what it means to really try. So of alcoholics who came to AA and really tried, 50% got sober at once and remained that way. So we see off the bat, people who come and really try and we'll see at once get sober and stay sober, a 50% success rate. And then it says 25% uh, sobered up after some relapses. 
So there's some people who took a took a uh, you know a shot at it and, and were relapsing a bit, but eventually achieved permanent sobriety. And so what we see is that this time in history, we see a 75% success rate, 75%. And if you're here today, like what I will point out is that's not bad. That is good numbers. You know what I mean? That's good. 75%. We're talking about the loosey goosey 50, but 75%. Now, if you're here today and you're like, Paige, I, I don't know. 75% still doesn't feel as comforting as I would like it to. I would like to remind all of us that if we're hanging out on a Monday together before coming to whatever 12 step fellowship brings you here i want you to point i want you to know that we have a zero percent success rate i am zero percent successful at trying to have permanent contented sobriety zero percent because otherwise why would you hang out with me i think i'm delightful but listen you're not gonna stick around for the bird stuff that long you know if your life doesn't depend on not the bird stuff your your life does not depend on the bird stuff you know what i mean but like like, honestly, I come here with a 0% success rate. Nothing has ever worked. Isn't that, and isn't that our experience? Isn't coming to the rooms of 12 step the last thing I try? And then what's the very, very, very last thing I try? The 12 steps. You know what I mean? I got to try everything else in the, in the rooms of 12 step before I actually try that, right? And it's like, I, I, I got nothing that works. <laughs> and then it's also important for me to like, this is just my experience and, and your experience might be different than my experience, but I've been doing this for a little while. And in the 14 and a half years, 14 or so years that I've been doing this, my experience is that I have never, and I mean never seen anyone who was doing this thing that failed. Now, we're going to talk about what it means to really try and what I mean when I say doing this thing or this thing doesn't have to be, it'll be this thing. I'll keep it, I'll make it normal. Uh, so it says, among the remainder, those who stayed on with AA showed improvement. Other thousands came to a few AA meetings and at first decided they didn't want the program. And so what we're seeing is that meetings are not the program. Now, I love meetings, genuinely. I, I, I For some reason, I, meetings has been, been something that has always, getting to meetings, that has been easy for me. I like going to meetings. You know, the prospect of free coffee and I get to talk about me? Heck yeah, I'm here for that, you know? <laughs> like, what's not to like? Some of them even have cookies and donuts. Like, are you kidding? Right? <laughs> like, that's not, I love meetings. There's a fellowship and I will say, you can, there's a feeling in the air, you know, whether it's on Zoom or in person, I feel better after. But meetings are not the program. They are not the program. And so when it says, I've came to AA really tried, they tried at what the program, what is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous? The program of Alcoholics Anonymous is the 12 steps taken out of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. So of those who came to AA and really tried working all 12 steps as a way of life, 50% got sober at once. 25, an additional 25 sobered up after some relapses. A 75% success rating of those who work these 12 steps as a way of life. I always throw in like, like, like their life depends on it because it does. 75%. And sometimes we talk about the numbers today. Now, the, how, how do we calculate numbers today? Well, from what I've heard, the best way to calculate numbers that they have is to divide the number of newcomers chips by the number of one year chips. And that's not a great way of doing it. But I'll tell you my experience is this is those who come to the fellowship, a 12 step fellowship and work these 12 steps as a way of life. I've not seen anyone do that in relapse. I've seen a lot of people come to, to meetings and just come to meetings and relapse. I've come to a lot of people go to meetings and get involved in service and relapse. I've seen a lot of people uh, sit on a fourth step and relapse. I've seen a lot of people avoid everything and anything they can to do to make amends and relapse or some of the events, and relapse. I've seen a lot of people have powerful, spectacular recovery and stop doing the work, stop working with others, you know, stop praying, stop meditating, stop doing inventory, and I've seen them relapse. But I've never seen anyone fully engaged in all 12 steps as a way of life relapse. I'm not saying it could not happen. I'm not saying it does not happen. I'm not saying my experience is, is the totality of experience, but I'm saying I've never seen, you know? And so, 
the power of God is, is, is always bigger than, than my fear and insecurities, you know? So one of the things that I want to do is I, I want to pop us um, to the back of the book. And I want to uh, just really quick go to page 569. We're going to go to page 569. We're going to go to the medical uh, view on AA. <clears throat> and I just, the reason I, is because I want to, I want to point out that these numbers are not, like these are some numbers that we see again and again and again. We saw it with the math at the start of the Ford, the second edition. We're seeing here it on page XX, and we're going to see it on page 569. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to the third full paragraph where it kicks off Dr. Kirby Collier, psychiatrist. So uh, 569, Dr. Cur Kirby Col Collier, psychiatrist. I felt that AA is a group unto themselves. And their best results can be had under their own guidance as a result of their own, of their philosophy. So what it's saying is like, hey, let's let let's let the drunks keep doing AA because and running it how they run it. I'm not going to interfere because you've got something that's working, guys. That's what he's saying. But in in smart medical speak, smart people words. And he says, any therapeutic or philosophic procedure which can prove a recovery rate of 50 to 60% must merit our consideration. So again, we're seeing those same numbers, 50 to 60%. Now, who here was jazzercised when I was talking about Florence Rankin and her, uh-uh, we're not calling this 100 men. Got some people jazzercised about that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Rebecca's like me, <laughs> like, oh, leave Rebecca, yeah. What I want to point out is if uh, if you're interested in some of the history and some of the early women in Alcoholics Anonymous, the woman who is credited with having uh, the first, the woman who is credited as being the first woman uh, in AA, like sober, permanent sobriety is Marty Mann. And in the next paragraph, it says Dr. Harry Tebow, psychiatrist. Dr. Harry Tebow was Marty Mann's doctor and gave her a copy of this book. And uh, and so and he's got what is what is he call is a king baby. He talks about alcoholics as king baby. Uh, so if you're interested in that, it's rude. It's rude to call us out so accurately. <laughs> All right. So back to page XX. <clears throat> page XX and uh, right after right after. Um, well, right. I, I don't think I wrapped up the uh, the paragraph. So I'll do that. So it says other thousands came to a few AA meetings and at first decided they didn't want the program. But great numbers of these, about two out of three, began to return as time passed. And I want to talk about the idea that people returning as time passed. It's because why would they come back? Because they could not find another answer. There was not another solution for them. So again, there's something here that works. And I really want to emphasize it does work. So um, another reason for the wide acceptance of AA was the ministration, like a whole whack of them. That's not the verbatim of what ministration means. Uh, it means buckets of. It doesn't. It doesn't. Rob's going to get a formal definition. Ministration is a whole bunch um, of friends, friends in medicine, and like a variety, friends in medicine, religion, and the press together with innumerable others. Innumerable is too many to count because there's buckets. Uh, who became our able and persistent advocates. And um, what we're to, oh, assistants or helper servants. Um, we talk about that um, idea that like too many to count, you know, med medicine, religion, and the press. So we saw those in medicine who were helping us out. And we saw those in the press who were, who were giving fair publicity for the work that we were doing, right? And it says, without such support, AA could have made only the slowest progress. Some of the recommendations of AA's early medical and religious friends will be found further out in this book. We, we were just there for the medical friends, the homies. Paige, stop calling them homies. I might not. I'll, I'll just let you know, I might not. <laughs> so Alcoholics Anonymous is not a religious organization. Neither does AA take any particular medical point of view, though we cooperate widely with the men of medicine as well as the men of religion, alcohol being no respecter of persons. What I want to point out, what like alcohol being no respecter of persons, what that means is that anyone can be an alcoholic. Alcoholism does not respect socioeconomic, gender, class, age, race, culture, religion, Alcoholism can affect anyone. That's what that means. Alcohol being no respecter of persons. 
we are an accurate cross-section of America. And in distant lands, the same democratic evening up process is now going on. And we talk about the democratic evening up process. What are we talking about? We're talking about by that same token, anyone can recover, regardless of age, gender, race, culture, uh, socioeconomic status, anyone can recover. It says, by personal religious affiliation, we include Catholics, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Hindus, and a sprinkling of Muslims and Buddhists. And it says more than 15% of us are women. Now, I want you to know in 2024, those are probably not great statistics. And you probably shouldn't be like, I'm going to have a sprinkling, you know, of, but I, and I, my brain goes very literally. I'm like, I love sprinkles. Uh, but what I will say is in 1955, those are inclusive numbers. Keep in mind, in 1955, when parts of the United States are still very, very much segregated, you know what I mean? And certain people are not allowed in certain buildings, you know, like those are inclusive and hopeful numbers. So I just always want to put that into context. Also, um, the, the Muslims, it's an older spelling of, of the word. If I just had somebody one time a couple of years ago point out, why is it spelled that way? And just if you're randomly like, why is that? Why is it? It's an older spelling. So. Just fun facts you didn't need. Um, at present, our membership is pyramiding at the rate of about 20% a year. So when there were the, this success rate and people were following these directions, it was going, growing 20% a year. And it says so far upon the total problem of several million actual and potential alcoholics, by the way, the only time in my life I ever had, I thought I had potential was when I would read like potential alcoholic. I'm like, that's me. I'm not, not a real, no, no, I just uh, potential, you know, but um, so far upon the total problem of several million actual and potential alcoholics in the world, we have made only a scratch. In all probability, we shall never be able to touch more than a fair fraction of the alcoholic problem in all its ramifications. So there's some humility. And we're saying we can't do everything for everyone. And, and we can't handle all of the problems of alcoholism, you know, things like homelessness and, and uh, medical issues. And like, we're saying like, hey, we, there's that humility, like, hey, we're not, we're not everything to everyone, you know? And it says, uh, upon therapy for the alcoholic himself, we surely have no monopoly. We're not saying that we are the only thing for you to try. We're not saying 12-step is the only answer. 12-step is the only way to go. That's not what we're saying. And again, some real humility. And, but it goes on to say, yet it is our great hope, a great hope, that all those who have as yet found no answer so if you're here today and you're like, man, I have not found an answer for the thing that is driving me into the ground, whatever brings you to this all-inclusive study, I've not found an answer. Our hope is that you may find one in the pages of this book, because that's where the directions on how to get well, the directions on how to recover lie, and will presently join us on the high road to a new freedom. Whenever we talk about a road or a path, I want to point out it's to a new freedom, but that new freedom is, well, I say there's a little bit of a vacation destination, but I'm continuing on this road. Do you know what I mean? That this is a way of life. This is not a set it and forget it program. This is how I live my life, and it is the path through which I live. So, uh, and also, Scott, bless you. I didn't want to say it right as you were sneezing. Uh, why why would i say that well it's still recording i could have waited literally two seconds so that seems like a natural stopping place why don't we stop uh there and we'll pick up to the forward to the third edition next week i'll stop the recording and we can wrap up with the prayer